Hello and welcome back to another lecture as part of the Black History Month programming. Um, today we have Extending Music Therapy to Communities of Color by Marisabel Diaz. Um, just a quick disclaimer, the views expressed by the speakers and workshop facilitators do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the organizing groups. Similarly, all programming uses the Zoom meeting or Zoom webinar format. The webinar format is to prevent unexpected interruptions. However, that doesn't mean we're not interested in hearing your voices. Uh, questions for speakers can be submitted using the Q&A chat function. Uh, very quickly, we again would like to thank the Black Project, that's the, the Black Literacy and Arts Collaborative, which supports resources for literacy and arts in communities of color and other underserved communities in the Boston area. They have mentorship programs, storytelling to build medical trust project. They have this amazing spread the love program where they get people to just say something nice to a stranger and book giveaways, among other things. You can find more information about them at the Black Project dot org and that is blac for black literacy and arts collaborative similarly a lot of this programming has been created by the people's heart it is a healthcare institution and community art and place making collaboration its mission is to change institutional healthcare culture and empower underserved patients and communities of color through art and design uh, programming includes art on walls, workshops, lectures, pop-up health clinics. You can find more about them at thepeoplesheart.org. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Lori Kubacek from Mass General Hospital. I will stop sharing my screen now. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, this is a very exciting day um, because I get your in introduced to you, Marissa Valdez Falcone, um, one of my amazing music therapists that has been um, a professional at MGH for the last four years, uh, was a student and intern before that, which was really exciting. I've gotten to kind of watch her grow through her whole entire music therapy process um, and come into this um, celebration of, of who she is as a person of color, uh, pursuing her master's degree in public health, um, representing the beautiful island of Puerto Rico, and um, just an absolute privilege to get the chance to welcome her here and uh, give her the chance to share some of her work with us. So give it up for Marissa Bell diaz Falcone. Thanks, Marissa Bell. Thank you, Lori. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marissa Bell, and I will share my screen here with you all. There we go. And so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about music therapy and ways in which we are working towards providing music therapy, expanding it to communities of color and enhancing um, the care that we provide. So, Topics of discussion include how music affects us, what is it about music that actually has an impact on us, what music therapy is, what music therapy services look like at MGH, and a quality improvement project that I have been working on as part of my public health degree. So how does music affect us? Well, music is something that activates multiple areas in the brain. As you can see in this picture here, it activates the motor cortex, the prefrontal, the sensory cortex, auditory, visual cortex. So it's all these areas in the brain that are associated with movement, coordination, executive functioning, language, emotional expression, um, reward circuitry, sensory integration, etc. And even if you think about the way that you might be are listening to a song and it just gives you chills or or you are motivated to kind of get up and dance well what's happening is that the reward pathway in your brain is being activated and that causes a release of dopamine and dopamine is that feel-good neurotransmitter the one that's um, directly involved with motivation so given that we know that we can use music in a way to enhance our mood to um, provide some emotional release and those are all positive things that can really support our well-being music is something that also shares a correlation with people's culture because it's something it's a way that people engage in their culture and there's different factors that can be influenced through culture and we also know that 
culture has an influence on health and it can be a way that can influence different symptoms and the way that a person may manage um, their health. And music is also something that can be experienced by all individuals. We work with patients from NICU patients to all the way older adults, so it's something that people of all abilities, all ages can engage in. Um, and the other thing I always like to mention about the impact that music has in our bodies as well is the way that maybe you're even listening to a song and you quickly like notice that you're bobbing your head to the beat of the music or that you are clapping or snapping your fingers to it and what's happening in that moment as well is that the auditory cortex and the motor cortex are, are working together to um, coordinate a movement to it so I also wanted to kind of mention that that ties into my first bullet point. Um, and I will click next. So music therapy, according to the American Music Therapy Association, is the clinical and evidence-based use of music to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialized music therapy professional that's completed a music therapy program. We seek education both at an undergraduate and graduate level, and then um, once we complete our training, we become board certified. And so this is a picture of my colleague, Hannah, with one of our patients and him engaging in music therapy. And he's actually playing a drum called the tambora, which is commonly used in merengue music. Um, and Hannah has some bongos. And music therapist, focus on developing tailored music experiences that can really support these opportunities related to self-expression, um, reducing pain perception, promoting relaxation, among many other goal areas. And it's something that impacts both mind and body functions that then help in treating a patient in a more holistic way. Um, so, yeah. There are various different interventions in which patients can engage in music. There are more active-based experiences that would be categorized under higher energy, and those include improvisation, singing, actively playing an instrument, learning how to play an instrument, music and movement, and then more receptive-based experiences that can include music conversation, music listening, songwriting, activities related to music technology, creating playlists that can, for example, enhance a person's mood or meet them where they're at with how they're feeling, as well as music-assisted relaxation techniques. And what's really great about our work is that we get to have that conversation either with the patient or a family member to get to see what a patient's relationship with music is and, and examine in what ways it could be of support. Um, so yeah. Some of the reasons for referral that a patient might be referred for music therapy services include mobility, communication, respiratory support, sensory stimulation, cognition, developmental support, emotional distress, pain management, and end-of-life support, as well as other um, goal areas that the provider who places the consult um, is, interested in, is interested in having us support at that moment. And currently, for our music therapy program, we are housed under the Integrative Therapies Program within the Cancer Center. So we provide services for both patients in the Cancer Center, inpatient pediatrics, and inpatient adult and pediatric um, psychiatry. Um, Lori, I'm not sure if there was anything else that you wanted to add in terms of our integrative therapies program. Uh, I think you pretty much covered it. We're a part of the Catherine A. Gallagher integrative therapies program and we're um, just really proud to get to represent the patients that we do. So I think that covers it. Okay, great. All right. So to put things a little bit in context, I, I want to invite you all to participate in this music experience and I'll be using the song I Can See Clearly Now by Johnny Cash and I have the lyrics here available and you are more than welcome to engage in any way that feels right if, if listening and, and kind of taking in the music in this moment is what feels best, then by all means go ahead. 
But if you're feeling like you want to sing, please sing. If you have an instrument or something nearby that you can use as an instrument, um, please do so. Um, and our bodies as well are great percussion instruments. So you can snap, clap, you can even kind of use um, any part of this area as like a, as an instrument, so. And I will say it's Johnny Nash. Johnny Cash is another great musician, but he did not write, I can see it clearly now. Thank but you. <laughs> get, get ready, everybody. Let's do this. Here we go. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my Shiny day. Let's do that part again. It's gonna be a bright, 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 sunshiny day. All right. Oh, yes, I can make it now. The pain is gone. Whoa. All of the bad feelings have disappeared. Here is that rainbow I've been. Praying for it's gonna be a bright, 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 sunshiny day. Let's do that again. It's gonna be a bright, 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 sunshiny day. Mm -hmm. Come on and go, let me see you. Oh, oh, oh. Ba -da -da -da. Ba -da -da -da. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. It's gonna be a bright, 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 sunshiny day. One more time. It's gonna be a bright, bright, bright. Sunshiny day. There we go. So when I think about um, that song, it has some themes tied to hope, courage, motivation um, that can be addressed when when used in, in a therapeutic relationship and kind of when used within a music therapy session. Um, and when inviting patients to sing, for example, it really allows for that time for some emotional expression and to explore different coping tools. So, yeah. So next I'll be talking a little bit about the project that I've been working on. So I am right at the end of the culminating, culminating experience for my public health um, degree. And I wanted to, as a minority myself, I wanted to see in what ways I could take a look at our, our music therapy program and see how can we best provide um, our services in an equitable way. And so that's why my project is titled Increasing the Access of Music Therapy Services for Marginalized Communities um, at Massachusetts um, General Hospital. And I'm specifically focusing on adult patients with cancer throughout this project. So what we do know is that health disparities for marginalized populations are experienced at a greater rate. We know that poor health outcomes in the U.S. have been associated with racial and ethnic and social economic differences. And these health disparities can lead to um, different things like poor quality of life, um, decreased economic opportunities and justice, and shorter life expectancy. And even if we think about the following example that I list of, of stress, um, it is experienced at higher rates for marginalized populations. And stress, yes, it is something that we all experience, but when we 
we experience it for long periods, it, it really does hinder our health and um, it can, for example, impact our immune system. So those are all really important things to think about, that these are, are long-term impacts um, to people's health. Um, and there's all these other factors that really influence these disparities, such as social cultural factors, health literacy, English proficiency, among other things that, like I said, can really have an impact. But what we do know is that these health disparities that have been seen in public health can be addressed through an interprofessional approach. And what that basically means is that um, providers from different professions are, are working in a team-based approach to um, treat the patient as a whole, um, not just specifically kind of targeting a, a symptom or, or a disease. And I think that this is where the arts and its integration in public health opens up the conversation of health isn't just the absence of disease, it really opens up the conversation about all these other elements that shape our view on health. And services such as music therapy can really assist in promoting um, some healthy behaviors and outcomes that can therefore improve a person's quality of life and treat them in a more holistic way. So past studies have shown that music therapy can improve quality of life, sleep, reduce um, symptoms such as fatigue, anxiety, depression, and alleviate um, pain for patients with cancer. And the interesting thing about music is that it uses all these unique qualities of music that can address these varying um, conditions and symptoms that are also tied to um, psychological distress and physical symptoms like the ones that they have listed here. But what we also know is that there is an underutil underutilization of integrative therapies. Um, not every hospital has music therapy services available or services are only available to certain populations. Um, and so this there's been studies that have shown that the lack of access that there may be in hospital settings can then lead to having individuals of marginalized populations maybe having some difficulties in accessing these outside of a hospital setting and having to pay out of pocket, which can be a challenge. Um, so yeah, and this has been noted for individuals, like I said, that fall within minority communities are less educated and are experiencing poverty. So what my project focused on was a couple of different things. I wanted to take a look at some data to see if race, ethnicity, and language were impacting referrals for the music therapy services um, at MJ, specifically for patients um, receiving cancer care. And I also wanted to take a look at the views of clinical providers regarding the implementation of music therapy when provided with educational materials. So this slide that I have right here provides you a little bit of a breakdown of the data that I was able to analyze. and. I, I conducted a chi-square and a Fisher's exact test that showed that race, ethnicity, and language are barriers in the referral placement process for, for music therapy because of the statistical significant relationship that they share. And we're, we were also able to see that the majority of the patients that were referred to our services were white and were native English speakers. And considering this this relationship between race, ethnicity, and language, um, it's important to consider what other barriers might be evident in the referral placement process. So this is where some of the educational materials come into play. So I, I provided two main things. I provided a resource sheet for clinical providers to understand what music therapy is, what role music therapy can have in culture, and um, ways that music therapy can be of support for marginalized populations. And I attached a survey to this that took a look at how beneficial they found these resources, what their workflow in the referral placement process was like, as well as um, what notable barriers there may be prevalent as they um, put in a referral for, for a patient. And I think that these types of materials like this are really important because they help music therapy in being recognized as a supportive treatment modality. And the more that clinical providers have a better understanding of it, the more that they are 
know how it can enhance and promote well-being for their patients. So the results of this survey that was tied to this research sheet was that um, it was proven to be beneficial for all of them and more than half of them found that they had a bit of a, of a better understanding of the way that music therapy can support marginalized populations and this kind of goes in hand with past research that has shown the impact that interprofessional approaches can really have in um, addressing health disparities and providing care in a more holistic way. Um, and this also demonstrates that this is a research sheet that can maybe be more widely distributed and have also a positive impact on clinical providers that we collaborate with. Um, for the consult placement process, the results really varied, but the majority of the people that filled out the survey said that they often um, place referrals after they discuss services with the patient. And almost all of them shared that they were interested in kind of receiving a short educational snippet of what music therapy is that can help them when they have that conversation with the patient, especially given the, the high demand that there's been of, of services. Um, and the other thing I provided was what you see on the right, which are some Spanish-based facilitation resources that I provided to the music therapy team. And the focus of this was to see in what ways this could help in increasing a provider's cultural competence and ways to kind of remove any barriers related to care for when working with patients within the Latinx um, community. And I'll go right here. And these are a couple of the pages within the, the resource sheet that I created. There's a little bit of a, of a guide that, that helps the, the provider take a look at what can hold them accountable to actually putting these resources to work. So asking them to watch a video that I made utilizing the common words and phrases and telling them, well, what are a couple words that you can integrate into your, your clinical work? And then also having them select a song from the song list that I made that um, had different genres, different themes, different ages that you could use this um, and ways that these songs could have specific musical components that they can maybe then talk about. Um, and Lori, I'll have you um, jump in a little bit and kind of explain what your experience was like because Lori was one of the people that I sent these resources to. Uh, so this was a really great um, experience for me because I, I have enough Spanish that I can have a very, very short conversation with pretty young people. Um, so this is actually really helpful to have these phrases here and have that accompanying video that kind of helped me sound more authentic to the language. That was really helpful. And then um, the thing that I loved is I was able to use this list and I pulled out like my four or five phrases that I wanted to start integrating. Um, and mine uh, was contemos, which is Let's, let's sing, escucha, which is listen, así, like this. Um, those are my three kind of new ones. And then I was like, well, why, maybe I should just put these together and make a song because A, that will help me remember them, and B, then I can sing the song. So I came up with a theme and I sent it to Marissa Bell so that she could tell me all of the ways that I can make it better. So I came up with contemos la 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 musica, uh, contemos la 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 la, así, like this. And then I sent it to her and she said, actually, this is really good, good rhythm, good this, good that. Um, but she gave me a, a grammatical representation that was better. So now I sing it like this. <clears throat> contemos con la 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 musica, Contemos, la, 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 así, like that. So that was really fun. Thank you very much. I know you're all clapping out there in webinar land. Thank you. Um, and then the other thing that I really appreciated about it is the song list that she made. And this is one page of how many, like there's like seven, eight, a million pages that show like the top songs by um, country or it shows by like style and then gives the country that they're from so it's just such a rich resource that um, really 
any music therapist or music educator or anyone that has anything to do with music and people could really benefit from. So um, two thumbs up for that. Thank you, Lori. And I'll share a little bit about the survey responses that I got back from our team. Um, they all shared that this type of resource was really helpful and that it could help them in increasing their cultural awareness and confidence when working with Spanish speaking patients. Um, and even thinking about the way that this can address some of the different factors related to the language barrier um, that can help improve the way our clinical encounters are with patients that may not be native Spanish speakers. Um, and especially with all respondents sharing that they were, they identified as novice as in Spanish speaking. Um, and responses to the open-ended question that I provided, it added a couple of different um, recommendations of what could help in making these resources better, like providing a more consolidated list, providing song links, um, and additional information related to maybe certain instruments that are often used with some of these styles or um, used in countries, kind of like the picture that I was talking about at the beginning where I knew that that's the instrument that they use for mitting and that it's called tambora. And I did forget to mention that going back I apologize for this. Going back to the resource sheet, um, there were there was an open-ended question that was really important, and it was related to asking the providers what barriers they noticed themselves in in the referral placement process. And some of the main things that they talked about was the impact that the visibility of of providers of the people in our team being available in the units, um, the impact that educational resources can have, and really having providers clearly understand this is what music therapy is, this is the different levels of engagement um, and patients that can really benefit from it. Um, and another important thing was that they noted was that one of the reasons that they might forget to place a referral for music therapy is because of all these other prevalent needs that patients that fall within marginalized populations might be facing that then they forget um, to offer music therapy. So those are all really good things to keep in mind as we work towards increasing the access of our services. And in conclusion, what this project has shown me is that there really is a positive impact in providing these types of educational materials, both to the clinical providers that we work with um, and the music therapy team. And this has helped in informing ways in which referrals could be increased and better approached. Um, but there definitely are things that we should further consider, like including music therapy facilitation resources for other communities, as well as distributing the resource sheet more widely among clinical providers at MGH to further explore what the impact on referral rates can have and the delivery of care. And I think another important thing is that it's not just about gaining cultural competence as music therapist um, through these facilitation resources, but also maybe even inviting people as culture bearers or people that are experts in these musical traditions of these um, different communities that can take part in the healthcare and clinical setting to help in improving the delivery of our services. And that wraps up my presentation. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was Hi. great. Here comes Dia. Hi, Dia. Hi, how are you? That was wonderful. Thank you, Marissa Bell, um, for that. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. And to start us off, I kind of have a question. In the presentation, I didn't sort of get the idea of how one goes about asking for this referral service. And how does one act right now find it? So we are, and Laura, you can also jump in. Um, but we, like I said, we are housed under the Cancer Center. So we do provide services for patients um, under these different kind of units that I spoke about. So patients within the Cancer Center and patient pediatrics, um, adult pediatric and adult inpatient psychiatry and PD inpatient psychiatry, but the way that the referrals are placed is through EPIC. Um, and so anyone 
within the care team of a patient can refer the patient for the services. So it could be the nurse, um, it could be a family member that may be inquired about the services that they can then let the staff member know and they will place the consult. It could be the doctor, um, social worker, among other people, even individuals within our integrative therapies team that maybe the acupuncturist work with a patient who does have a strong relationship with music that then they're able to ask the doctor of this patient to then put in the order or so. And the one thing I would add is unfortunately we're, um, we're not prevalent throughout the entire hospital because we are really, um, we can only go where we have funding at this point. We're not hospital funded, we're philanthropically funded as are all of the integrative therapists in the Catherine e. Gallagher Integrative Therapies Program. So um, that's one of the challenges, like there, we know that there's many different groups of people that really could benefit from, from music therapy, be they the marginalized um, populations, uh, patients with Alzheimer's, um, patients with, you know, expressive aphasia where like research has shown, but we don't have funding in all of these areas to see maybe all of the people that we've, we've had, you know, research that's shown it's wildly impactful with, with this population. So we try to, you know, with the work that Marissa Bell's doing, we're really trying to see, well, within, within the places that we are funded, how can we make sure that music therapy is equitable um, across the board and is really serving the patients that have the highest need of it? And that's, it's just a constant um, education process with the, with providers and just doing the best we can to get the word out. So you're saying that someone has to know where you are and know that you exist and be within a particular system within the hospital at the moment to be able to access um, the program that you offer. Yeah, um, just to some degree, or they might go into Epic and they might find that music therapy is a thing, but and then they put in a referral, but we can't see them because they are outside of our oh. departments. So it's a bit tricky. It is a bit tricky on various levels, I'm understanding, within Epic, within the computer system, within the actual um, system of the hospital itself. So advertising and getting the word out is a challenge for you. It is a challenge and we're all, and, and then there's just capacity because we there is only basically three of us, like three FT full-time music therapists here split between a couple of uh, people. So, um, you know, I, I wish we had a team like the physical therapy or the occupational therapy or the speech therapist where there's many, 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 many people that can serve all of the patients that have those, those needs. And you and Marissa Bell have talked about this uh, amongst each other, I assume, as you've been talking about equity. Is there a vision that you have, Marissa Bell? That's a great question. Um, I think my main thing at this point with, with where we are in, in the specific units that we provide our services is how are we best providing education about what we do that can help providers and, and have a better understanding of this is something that I should definitely consider for, for all my, all the diverse patients that I that I see. Um, so I think that's that's the main thing that I'm noticing that advocacy and education is is really key to helping um, make our our work more equitable. Okay. Um. Thank you. It's a, it's a, I saw how your face just got, okay, there's, that's too big for me to hold right now. Um, uh, expression. So I can, I can understand, uh, I can understand that. And there is a question in the Q and A. There is a question in Q and A. Uh, and it reads, uh, this was a great presentation. Do you know how often it is that the patient themselves are more skeptical of music therapy rather than the doctors? Mm -hmm. Also, uh, is this generally an affordable option for patients, whether it be, whether through insurance or otherwise? Uh, well, thank you. Great question. Um, there is oftentimes that patients are 
are skeptical about um, or are just uncertain about well what music therapy even is and so that's the role that we get to play of, of really having that conversation of of why music therapy what can it really do to help address challenging moments in your hospitalization and how can music be of support um, so yeah the can the question just went away okay there we go um, so yeah I hope that kind of answers a little bit of the first chunk of the question and I feel like sometimes I just when I meet a patient and they're like eh, I don't know but the door is like kind of somewhat open I I tell them we can just try this for five minutes. We can try something for five minutes. Um, and just a little bit ago, um, last week I had a patient who was pretty skeptical, um, English speaker and, and everything. So had a very good understanding of what I was kind of saying, but it wasn't until I, I sat down with my guitar that he was like, wow, that just gave me chills. And he smiled and the change in, in his affect was like instant. Um, so it just it just took a, the willingness to also be open to something that they're um, that is unknown to them. And there has been information that I also want to look at about that. It's like it's not just about we have patients that said no that were English speakers that um, were introduced to services. What is it about the way that we maybe are introducing that is also providing kind of that uncertainty and what can we do better? So. And then the second question also, is this generally an affordable option for patients, um, whether that be insurance or otherwise? Um, so, Lori, maybe you can help me with this question too, but um, I do know that there are some outpatient programs that do have insurance that that music therapy can be covered by insurance but others are it's out of pocket um, that services are offered um, and I don't I apologize but I don't know how much typically it would cost out of pocket but one of the beautiful things about Massachusetts General Hospital is they have been committed for many 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 years over you know 20 years to integrative therapies and getting them to patients free of charge. That is amazing. So in, in our hospital, our services are free, um, but again, it has to fall within these departments that we currently have funding for. So um, that's why we really wanna make sure that we're accessing patients who could really use it while they're here and at their most vulnerable. Um, so we wanna keep working on that. Then once you move beyond this house um, and go out into the world, then there is a, a, a service just as if you would go to any other service that kind of goes beyond. And there is less insurance coverage for music therapy as opposed to some of the other like healthcare professions like occupational therapy, physical therapy, acupuncture is got incredible um, insurance coverage right now. We're so happy for that. Um, music therapy is definitely still far behind in that, but a, but a really good question. And thank you, Mass General Hospital, for supporting integrative therapies. And for making it free to, yeah. to patients. Um, that's, a, that's a dedication in some way. Um, how old is the program? Um, the integrative therapies program is older than the music therapy program. So I jo I started the music therapy program in 2004, and I believe Irene and her team had already been here um, maybe since the late 90s, early 2000s. So it's it's been a good it's been a good long time that there has been at least some component of integrative therapies. Um, and it started this big and now has definitely gotten much bigger. We're, we're very proud of, of our whole integrative therapies team. Um, and we have, we have been very excited that um, the acupuncture and massage and yoga programs have expanded and are now serving our sickle cell population in the cancer center. Um, so that's just, that's been an amazing program to, again, get your hands out there into the world and really see people are in high, high amounts of pain and facing so many health disparities. And to be able to have these services there um, when they need it most is, is really amazing. And music therapy is getting ready to start um, also expanding into this population, which is 
really, really wonderful because it is an in incredible um, tool to help people manage pain. And obviously for every, every person, it's a little bit different, but we've already had some really very, very powerful stories about how music can kind of, if you, if you come at it in the right way, um, can help all that full brain processing kind of interrupt those pain messages. So it's really exciting work. So maybe next year we'll be able to talk more about our work with the sickle cell population because we'll have had a year of more experiences under our belt. I was actually going to ask you about that. I'm curious to know now that you're in that process of moving into a new area into the hospital, what does that look like for a program like yours? How do you, how do you, I mean, what do you do to prepare yourself to, to participate or in, to provide care? Yeah, that is a, a great question. Um, you ask questions and you, you talk to the people that know a lot more about working with this, again, really vulnerable population of patients. So um, my team doesn't know it yet, but we have a training coming up in the next couple of weeks with um, Dr. Charles Lazar of the, the Sickle Cell Program. Um, and there's also been some incredible, incredible specific music therapy research with the sickle cell population done out of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, there's uh, this gentleman, um, I am not able to grab his name right now, but he has done incredible research with this population and has been doing it for years. So I'm just reading his work and really learning about how to work with this specific diagnosis that also happens to have this additional um, marginalized and cultural components to it as well. So there's the logistics of a patient that's got extraordinary pain, but then there's all these other areas of suffering that um, patients with sickle cell disease have to go through, you know, physically, emotionally familiar, um, socioeconomically and it's how do you how do you look at that whole package and really try to help alleviate suffering on all of these different areas not just the physical but um, these other ways as well and so yeah it takes some it takes some learning about um, from experts in the field and but at the end of the day they're just people and as Marissa Bell said almost everybody has some kind of connection to music and that's the doorway that we walk through more often than not. That's the doorway that helps anyone that's skeptical about music therapy, like a large percent of them are, are not skeptical about their connection to music. And so we walk on, we walk through that door first and get them connecting with how music is a part of their lives. And then that can lead us to many other conversations. So that part, it doesn't really matter what, who you are or where you come from, that connection is still that one of that main thread that helps us get from point A to point B. And then we can start figuring out how it can be used as a therapeutic modality. It makes me think a little bit of dancing, uh, about dancing too. Once you know the music comes on, I, I need to move. And so I, yeah, and so I wonder if it's similar to that. Um, but something you said was interesting to me. Uh, I didn't realize that um, sickle cell was specific to what I understood from what you said was maybe specific to a particular population of people. Could you speak a little more to that? Like, how do you? Yeah, yeah it is a it is a genetic trait that is um, almost exclusive to the to the black community. There is, there's some instances, I, again, I'll have to talk to my medical team once we get our training, but it is definitely, the majority of it is, is by, uh, impacted by black American, black people. Okay. Um, so there's, so there are lots of other socioeconomic and, um, cultural and biases that come up with that. Um, Okay, are, are there studies being formed to figure this out as we go along or are we gonna get there and see what it's like? This is, this is why you have to reach out to our sickle cell program people, get right. them in here, have them talk about it. And, and the, the sickle cell 
the, the sickle cell program at MGH is, is relatively new and we're really, really proud of it. So again, it would be a great presentation for, for future. Or if Irene Martinik, the program manager for acupuncture comes on, ask her, she and her team okay. are doing really, really good work there. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to put them in the question answer um, box. Um, oh, one others. Marisol, you want to take this one? Yeah, yeah. that one. Um, do you find that music therapy can be successful if the patient and therapist aren't speaking the same language? Um, yeah, I think. And then the other question is, do you have the use of interpreters? Yeah, I think the unique aspect of music is that it's something that really connects us to people despite not speaking the same language and we can really um, develop a therapeutic rapport and relationship with the person despite not speaking their language. But I think there's definitely things that as a clinician, you wanna be really aware of how you're communicating with the patient in the best way. Through even the use of interpreters, I often use the IPOP. Um, if there's not a family nearby that is translating, that I can then have that conversation with the patient of these specific questions that I approach them with as I meet them, of getting to know, well, what is your relationship with music? Do you like listening to music? What do you like listening to? All those important questions that can then help me um, decide what route to take and, and finding the best um, ways to support them. Can you say what an IPOP is? Because I don't think everybody knows that. <laughs> yeah, well, I typically use it. It's it's a basically like um, an application that you can use either even like on your phone that you call interpreter services and they have an interpreter um, in the moment that is translating the conversation that you're having um, with the patient. And there's also phones within the patient's room that you're able to facilitate that conversation as well. Thank you. <laughs> And one of the things that I will say is that, um, and Marisabel mentioned this, like that kind of like sheet she gave for Spanish facilitation of like these best, like really helpful phrases to have, like short, not like full sentences, just like music today, musica hoy, like these little things, like to have those in many languages is really helpful. And I like accidentally know a little bit of Russian and have gotten to use that with some patients and just to have that like that handfuls worth of understanding in a language can really get you far it can't get you as far as as I think I would like it to get me and that's where use of either a translation app which works mostly <laughs> <laughs> ish um, or an actual translator to like try to pair your your initial music assessment like at the end of a, an appointment where the translator is working with the doctor or a nurse like that's a nice way to kind of be like oh hey can you just hang out for you know five more minutes I've got these three questions that I really want to ask and then moving forward it's a little bit easier to to rely more on the music as that kind of connection point. But it, it, it would be great if we just understood everything or had that, that handful of knowledge in like all the languages, but sadly that's not the case. And I know for me that does become a barrier sometimes because I get nervous. It's like, oh, I, I'm not gonna know if I can pronounce this language at all well. And then I just need to, I need to get over that and I need to just get an interpreter then so that I don't allow my lack of confidence speaking a, a particular kind of language become a barrier to someone getting music. And that's on me, really. It sounds like you're really hard on yourself there. <laughs> well, it's just, it's a, it's a reality and it's, and it's a hard one when you work in a hospital and everybody's new all the time, you know, so it's just, it's trickier here. But if, if cultural competence is your gold standard, which it should be, then it's something that we need to figure out how to do better at. And I, I know I don't always do better at. So um, this, this whole week is about like looking at the world from all different kinds of perspectives and seeing maybe areas where you're doing well and seeing areas where maybe you can, you can do better and we can all do a little bit better. So it's pretty amazing that we have this forum to kind of be able to come together and, and own that and acknowledge it. 
It's lovely. Um, and I actually wonder if uh, you can both talk a little bit about your exchange in Spanish, um, because I assume that while you were creating this project, the, the study together and talking about language, you were speaking to each other in Spanish and in English and going back and forth. Um, and I can see that you have this lovely uh, mentor-mentee relationship as well uh, that has, that as I, if I remember correctly, has carried forward for um, quite a while. Um, from student right up to dissertation, is that where we're headed? Um, Close, it's more, well, they, they give it all these different names, but capstone, so that's right. what they call it. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. And let me just say, first of all, I do not speak Spanish. <laughs> I will never say that I speak Spanish, and this is all her project. I'm just here as someone who gets to, um, uh, be a, a like a, a, a reference for her. So this is all her. And someday I wish to be able to have a back and forth with Marissa Bell in Spanish. That would be amazing. So basically what I say is, I wrote this kid song in Spanish. What do you think of it? So that's the exchange, <laughs> just to clarify that. Um, but uh, the mentor part is has been really amazing because, like I said, I got to watch Marissa Bell come from student to intern to new professional. But I think my favorite part is when I got to mentor Marissa Bell and how to be a mentor for our students and our interns. So I don't know if you want to talk at all about that, Marissa Bell, um, either in regards to just global or with how you address any cultural things or anything like that. Um, yeah, I think it's been, I was just telling Lori yesterday, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm it's going to be four years slash four years and a half from, from being um, a student slash intern to now working as a young um, professional. And I think that having emphasized the importance of all these cultural competencies within my training that I'm now shedding light on this and emphasizing it also on my my now you know interns that i i work with with my colleagues and with lori has been really important and and all these different nuggets that lori calls of of things that i learned that i'm now kind of passing along to them and and from my experience as as a latina and as someone whose first language is spanish um i get to also come and show them all these different rhythms that i grew up listening to and ways that i've grown to approach music from a latin cultural perspective that really expands their clinical toolbox when working with patients of diverse backgrounds that I think is it's pretty unique so it is we didn't even get a chance to discuss how where that falls into place you brought up a whole new point and a whole new area um, when folks are coming from different backgrounds there are different rhythms that they are familiar with and comfortable with so um, what happens when you hit a rhythm that nobody likes or someone doesn't like? What happens then? I think that's where having that conversation of what are the the patient preferences in, in the music. But I will say it's also just not making the assumption of, oh, I'm working with a, an, another Puerto Rican. Of course, they're going to love salsa and they're going to love all these other um, Puerto Rican based music. So it's it's also that internal bias that we carry in ourselves that we really have to be checking ourselves about um, that help us kind of really focus on what what do we want to know about this person and the relationship with music that um, isn't just based on my assumptions of it um, and even just the the assumption of, of this is how this type of person typically would present within a session you know um, I do oftentimes have Puerto Rican or, or Hispanic patients or that are very much like they open up quickly, but I can't think that that's always going to be the case with every patient or every family that I work with. So it's all these different components that I'm, I'm keeping track of and that I'm passing on to students. Um, so, yeah. And the one other thing I could add to that, I, I think about um, some cultural music uh, that has like some music from Indian cultures where they have all these half tones and like the the melodies are so like they have more notes than I as as a Western person 
understand and will ever be able to do justice to. If I tried to sing some songs from other cultures and try to really represent them, I, I may fail very badly. So one, it's understanding what my limits are as a musician and can I, can I work on that? And if I can't, how can I utilize pre-recorded music or um, utilize maybe other musicians in the, in the Boston area that could help me make a recording for a patient? You know, how can I be creative outside of my little box here to really best um, find something that would speak to that person and that person's culture? Um, and it's, I, I, I often think about like when I get really old and I'm, and I'm one of those people that's like, Oh, those kids, I don't know their music. You know, that's sorry. That's my Wisconsin coming out. Like, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. I want to keep my connection no matter what the culture is. If it's an age culture, you know, those, those young kids, or if it's this, you know, this, uh, country's music that I've never heard of before, what can I do to either acquire new knowledge or get help from resources around me. I love the idea of reaching out to uh, Boston area musicians and, um, you know, building a network who comes in to, to the hospital uh, to, to share their music and their kind of music. Yeah. And there's challenges with that. I will say that because you can't just have every anyone come in with any kind of music. Um, there has to be some kind of like someone needs to be checking their excellence level and not bringing in songs that are going to be overly triggering. But we do have a collaboration with the Boston Hope Music Project, which started out of um, COVID and the the field hospital that that was set up. And through this collaboration that I'm a part of, um, I've now learned about. Um, virtual bedside concerts that some um, medical students have started and they will bring in high level performers and find um, families, especially around uh, holidays that are stuck in the hospital and they will invite that patient's family members. Again, this came out of COVID when there was so much isolation and they'll give a concert to like a full Zoom room of patient and their families. And it's just people really, really love it. And to think about then, could you do, could you match someone with like a specific cultural kind of music and bring that musician into the, like, that would be amazing, but that would be like six full-time jobs right there to, to, <laughs> to do that and to do it well. Um, so we don't have that capacity yet, but there are people who are much smarter than I am that are thinking about ways to to not just have music therapy in places where people need it, but also to just better have access to music um, and live live music, even though it's over Zoom. So it's an it's a very interesting um, project, and I'm really proud of the work that's been done on it. But again, that's outside the scope of music therapy because that's more performance based. But it's still music, and it's that connection that's really beautiful. Maybe we hold this for another conversation, uh, another time, but maybe there's there's room to maybe discuss the difference between art, uh, music therapy and music as performance as well. I feel like that's a whole nother um, hour long session, uh, but I'm really appreciative of the care and attention that you have put into building out this building out the small large program that you have and expanding it in ways that i know you haven't talked about because you're just sharing stories at the end of it um <laughs> uh, but it's exciting to hear that there is so much more happening and for a small team um you're doing some big important work and carrying it forward and you have been um, and I will say that we're all just really proud of the work that Marissa Bell has done kind of pursuing this public health lens and pairing it with music. It's it's such an incredible um, melding of, of the different parts of her mind and heart. And I'm just really excited to see all of the places that that takes her as a person and our program um, in the future. So it's really exciting. So good job, Marissa Bell. <laughs> 
And good job, Lori, too, for getting her to where she needed to be to be herself. So Thank you very much. I'll take it. Yeah. I mean, this is this is why it's a teaching hospital and a teaching program. And this is where that beauty happens um, and is passed along without mentorship. We only know what's in a book. Um, you know, um, it teaches us the rest of it. So thank you. Thank you for the education. Thank you for getting us started. Thank you for the research you're doing, uh, for the work you've already done, and you're clearly going to be doing so much more uh, in the coming year. So that's exciting. Thank you for and being thank you to People's Heart and, and the, the Black Project for pulling all this together. What a, what a great opportunity this whole week. So thanks.